In my 11 of the worst YouTubers video, I discussed Austin Jones, a YouTuber who became famous by uploading song covers. He was even set to perform on the 2015 Warp Tour until it was revealed that he had been messaging underage girls in private and getting them to perform explicit acts for him on camera. There's no denying that he's a scumbag, but his story got me thinking about how there have been other musicians out there far worse than him. So I've decided to list the ones who I consider to be among the most evil. Here are seven of the most evil musicians. Tim Lambesis is the lead singer of the American metalcore band As I Lay Dying. Despite the band's music being what many religious people would have seen as satanic years ago, Lambesis has always portrayed himself as a devout Christian, often writing about the teachings of Jesus in his music and even having Jesus and a cross tattooed on his body. He also adopted three Ethiopian children and really seemed to love them as if they were his own flesh and blood. All in all, Lambesis seemed like a very nice religious man and a loving father. However, as you can probably guess from his inclusion in this video, things obviously took a dark turn. In August 2012, while on tour with As I Lay Dying, Lambesis sent an email to his wife informing her that he no longer loved her, no longer believed in God, and had been having an affair. The two later divorced, with his ex-wife Megan Murphy stating that Lambesis was obsessed with working out at the gym and also wasted thousands of dollars on tattoos. She also stated that he was very negligent towards his children, including in situations that could have been potentially dangerous for them, such as falling asleep while they were playing in the pool. In May 2013, Lambesis was arrested after it had been reported that he had paid $20,000 to hire a hitman to murder his wife. He had apparently asked an acquaintance at the gym if they knew anyone who would kill his wife. Lambesis was referred to a hitman with the code name RED, who asked him if he really wanted his wife dead, to which he replied, yes, that's what I want. He then gave RED $1,000 for expenses, pictures of his wife, her address, and the date on which to carry out the hit. He also asked for the hit to be carried out while he was with his children so that he'd have an alibi. However, RED was actually an undercover police officer, and with all the evidence he collected against Lambesis, carried out the arrest on May 7th. Brett, the man who Lambesis had met with at the gym to inquire about hiring a hitman, had actually informed the police of what he was planning, who later told Brett to give Lambesis the number of a sheriff's deputy playing the role of Red. When Lambesis met with Red, he was repeatedly recorded saying he wanted his wife dead. Lambesis pleaded not guilty to the charges, with his lawyer claiming that his thought process had been hampered by his steroid use. He was more irritable, he was more reactive, he was not the good Christian that was Jesus-like in high school. In 2014, Lambesis changed his plea to guilty and was sentenced to six years in prison. A popular Christian rock singer from Carlsbad is now admitting he hired a hitman to kill his wife. Today, Tim Lambesis, lead singer of the musical group As I Lay Dying, changed his plea to guilty. In a Vista courtroom, he changed his not guilty plea to guilty for soliciting the murder of the mother of his three children and wife of eight years. How do you plead guilty? Prosecutors say he and his estranged wife, Megan, were going through a contentious divorce, battling over money and custody issues with their three adopted children. Lambesis feared she would get more than half of his earnings and he wanted her dead. During his imprisonment, he made a statement claiming that he and the rest of As I Lay Dying were all atheists and had only pretended to be Christian in order to sell records, a statement which his bandmates called slanderous. Lambesis later made another statement in which he claimed that he'd actually denounced his Christianity to make it easier for him to have an affair. He was released from prison on parole in 2016 and later even reunited with As I Lay Dying. Perhaps Lambesis will be able to revive his career, though in all honesty, he really doesn't deserve any success after what he's done. I honestly don't see how anyone could support a man who tried to have his wife murdered, but there are unfortunately some very forgiving fans out there. That said, the people you'll be seeing on this list going forward only get worse from here. Luke Helder's musical career was quite brief. Born in 1981 to an army commander father and health worker mother, Helder was an art and industrial design student at the University of Wisconsin Stout. By all accounts, Helder was a good student who was polite and attentive in class. 
In the year 2000, he and two college friends formed a grunge band named Apathy, in which he performed guitar and lead vocals. The band saw some local success and funded their own CD entitled Sacks of People, though despite their following, record stores attempting to sell copies of the CD ended up having to give them away, as nobody was buying them. In a way, it was quite appropriate that Luke fronted a grunge band, as back when the genre first emerged in the late 80s, it was seen by some as being anti-establishment and anti-authoritarian, and Luke held a strong dislike for the United States government. In May 2002, Helder told his roommate that he was going to a party. Though he was skipping work to do this, his roommate thought nothing of it. However, his roommate later received a text from Helder saying he wouldn't be back for another two days, but also asked him to check the news. It was revealed that Luke had gone on a cross-country journey planting pipe bombs in mailboxes. In total, 18 had been found. Six of these bombs were detonated when the mailboxes were opened, and although no one was killed, the people who opened these mailboxes suffered gruesome injuries to their hands from the ball bearings and nails that the bombs were loaded with. Luke had included letters with the bombs, calling them attention getters, and in all of them, he denounced the government, expressing his displeasure with them, in his mind, controlling the everyday lives of the people of the United States. As this incident happened so soon after 9-11, the bombings received a lot of media attention, and mail workers in some areas refused to deliver for a while out of fear for their safety. Luke's roommate discovered a bag under his bed containing bomb-making materials. He then informed Luke's parents, who contacted the police. The FBI said today it has identified a suspect in the mailbox bombings throughout the Midwest. He is a 21-year-old Wisconsin college student named Luke John Helder. Mr. Helder is suspected of having something to do with the 18 bombs which have been found in five states including one which was found today in Amarillo, Texas. The FBI is asking Helder, an industrial arts student at the University of Wisconsin Stout, to turn himself in. We encourage, as a public safety message here, Luke Helder to make contact with us. We do not want to see him harmed or any public harmed. Sources tell ABC News that one of Helder's roommates told investigators there was evidence of black powder residue and pieces of pipe in their off-campus apartment. And investigators were told that Helder had not been seen on campus for a week. Investigators have recovered fingerprints from the evidence left behind at the crime scenes. They want to compare those to Helder's fingerprints. According to sources, FBI and Postal Service investigators also contacted Helder's father, who said his son had made anti-government statements in the past. I really want you to know that Luke is not a dangerous person. I think he's just trying to make a statement about the way our government is run. Luke was later found in Nevada and was apprehended after a police chase. Luke revealed the locations of the rest of the bombs, and he had planted them in a way that made it so that when the locations were marked on a map, it resembled a smiley face. This led to him being known as the smiley-faced bomber. He pleaded not guilty to the charges against him and eventually pleaded insanity. He was deemed incompetent to stand trial and has been detained in a mental ward since 2004. In 2013, a judge ordered for Helder to be re-evaluated for competency to stand trial. If he is found to be mentally sane, it's likely he will be sentenced to life in prison for his actions considering that he essentially carried out a one-man terrorist attack with no regard for the safety of the innocent people who would inevitably open the mailboxes he planted the bombs in. It definitely seems like keeping him behind bars for the rest of his life might be for the best. Mirror, mirror framed in gold. In your depths, a story hold of a rock star who became a monster with an awful name. Definitely one of the more infamous and hated people on this list. Paul Gadd, known almost exclusively by his stage name Gary Glitter, is a British rock singer who was most active during the glam rock era of the 1970s. He'd actually begun his career in 1960, releasing his first single at the age of 15 under the name Paul Raven. His career didn't take off, however, until 1971 when he released two singles, Rock and Roll Part 1 and Rock and Roll Part 2, both of which became huge hits in the UK, and the latter being one of the few glam rock songs to reach the Billboard Top 10 in the US. 
Around this time, he began wearing his trademark glitter suit and platform shoes, which would become one of the most iconic looks of the glam rock era. He would go on to have 11 top 10 hits in the UK, including the number one hit, I am the leader of the gang, I am. After this, however, his career began to stall, and he announced his retirement from the music industry in 1976. The next year, he declared bankruptcy. It wasn't until the 1980s when he began to finally claw his way back into the charts. With his 1981 Christmas hit, Another Rock and Roll Christmas, guest appearances with other artists helped him to maintain his relevance for the rest of the decade and into the 90s. He also faced legal trouble around this time, however, as he had been arrested three times for drunk driving, with the last arrest resulting in a 10-year driving ban. His success continued into the 90s, with him releasing the best-selling autobiography, The Leader, and also performing at the opening ceremony of the 1994 FIFA World Cup in Chicago, which was viewed by hundreds of millions of people in 46 countries. He was also set to make a cameo in the Spice Girls movie, Spice World. <laughs> They will take you away one day, won't they? Oh, They'll come that. and go, this is it, Gary. Do you reckon? We're off. Straight jacket and all. <laughs> In 1997, his career would crash and burn after a disturbing revelation about Glitter's private life became public. In November 1997, Glitter had taken his laptop to PC World for repairs. What the technician found on Glitter's hard drive shocked him. The police were informed that the technician had discovered thousands of pornographic images on the hard drive, all of them involving children. The police then searched his homes in London and Somerset and discovered more images. The story quickly spread through the media and Glitter's cameo in Spice World was removed in response. In total, Glitter was found to be in possession of over 4,000 images. On November 12, 1999, he was sentenced to four months in prison and registered as a sex offender. Upon his release, he expressed regret for what he did and said he wanted to move on from the incident. I deeply regret doing what I was sent to prison for. I've served my time. I want to put it all behind me. I live my life. Glitter was rejected by the British public following the incident and fled to Spain. He lived on his yacht, which was moored in Soto Grande for six months, and told the locals his name was Larry Brillante. His real identity was eventually discovered, leading to him fleeing to Cambodia. However, he was arrested there in late 2002 due to his previous convictions and jail for four days before being released on bail. Before returning there, he had attempted to enter Thailand. However, he was denied entry, as he was considered a danger. Over 19 countries stated that he was denied entry before he finally returned to the UK. Upon his return, he was immediately added to the Sex Offenders Register for life. In 2012, the British police launched Operation Yew Tree, an investigation into historical allegations of child sexual abuse following the scandalous revelations of countless indecent acts committed by British TV presenter Jimmy Savile. Glitter was among those arrested by the police. In 2014, he was charged with eight counts of offences committed against girls aged between 12 and 14, between the years of 1977 and 1980. In 2015, he was also accused of committing obscene acts with three more girls between 1975 and 1980. On February 5, 2015, he was convicted of rape and four counts of sexual assault and was sentenced to 16 years in prison. Since his first conviction in 1999, Glitter has been seen by everyone as nothing more than a disgusting human being, and rightly so. His career is now non-existent, and at 77 years old, most people now only wonder if he will live to see his release, or if he will die in prison. Regardless, he will always be known now as, to quote Gary himself, the rock star who became a monster.
ain't always what they seem. This entry is where things get truly disgusting. Born Ian David Carsdake Watkins in 1977, Ian was, by all accounts, a normal child growing up and had a love for rock music. It was at Hawthorne High School where he met fellow music fan Mike Lewis. The two formed a thrash metal band called Aftermath and would usually perform in Watkins' shed. While at the Full Pony Festival, Ian met another musician, guitarist Lee Gaze. With Aftermath having split up, Watkins and Gaze formed a band called Fleshbind, but this group was also short-lived. Watkins and Lewis later reunited in a hardcore punk band called Public Disturbance, with Watkins as the band's drummer. The two stayed with the band for three years before leaving the band in 1998 to focus on what was originally their side project, Lost Profits, which also included Ian's Fleshbind bandmate Lee Gaze on lead guitar and Mike Chaplin on drums. After spending two years touring the UK and gaining a following, the band released their first studio album, The Fake Sound of Progress. At first, the album received little attention, but upon the release of the two singles, Shinobi vs Dragon Ninja and the album's title track, the band went on to receive much more mainstream attention. This led to them touring with big name bands such as Linkin Park and Deftones as an opening act. They also toured at Ozfest and played at other major events such as Glastonbury and the Reading and Leeds Festival. In the following years, Lost Profits would go on to even more success, with their second album, Start Something, going to number 4 on the UK charts in 2004. Their third album, Liberation Transmission, debuted at number 1 on the UK album charts in 2006 and featured what was probably the band's best known song, Rooftops. During this time, however, Watkins had fallen into a terrible drug habit, being addicted to cocaine, ecstasy, and meth. 2008 would be the year when the first signs of just what kind of man Ian Watkins really is would come to light. In December of that year, Joanne Majelic, a former soldier and sex worker, had reported Watkins to the Pontypridd Child Services for sexual abuse towards several 14-year-old girls after Watkins had bragged about taking their virginities. In January 2009, a police investigation was launched against Watkins following these allegations. However, this case was eventually closed later that year. Majelic attempted to report him several more times between 2009 and 2011, but no action was taken by the police. However, on April 3rd, 2012, one day after Lost Prophet's fifth album, Weapons, was released, a video surfaced of Watkins performing an obscene and disgusting act on an infant. Another video surfaced of him engaging in acts with an underage fan from Boston, Massachusetts. In December 2012, Watkins was arrested and charged with 13 sex offences against children, one of whom was only one year old. In November 2013, he pleaded guilty to the charges against him. It was also reported that he had sent a message to one of the women he was seeing saying, If you belong to me, so does your baby. The day after his plea, he was reported to have made a phone call to a fan from prison, in which he described his horrific acts as mega lols, showing no remorse for what he had done. On December 18th, 2013, Watkins was sentenced to 29 years in prison, with eligibility to apply for parole after serving two-thirds of his prison term, followed by six years of supervised release. After giving the sentence, the judge concluded that the case plunged into new levels of depravity. A senior investigating officer on the case described Watkins as a committed, organized paedophile and potentially the most dangerous sex offender he had ever seen. The other members of Lost Prophets formed a new band called No Devotion and recruited singer Jeff Rickey to effectively take Watkins' place as they had made it clear that they wanted to sever all ties to their disgraced former lead singer. While his old bandmates continue on, Watkins is currently sat in a prison cell where he'll most likely remain until 2042 as it seems very unlikely that the UK authorities have any intention of allowing someone as dangerous and as sick as him back into society.
I couldn't make a video about evil musicians without including Varg Vikernes. Born Christian Vikernes in 1973 in Bergen, Norway, he and his family moved to Iraq when he was six years old, as his father was an electronics engineer developing a computer program for Saddam Hussein. There were no places left at the English school in Baghdad, so Varg had to go to an Iraqi elementary school. Varg later recounted that he faced racial discrimination from the other students at this school. On one occasion, Varg got into an argument with his teacher and called him a monkey. He stated that the teacher wouldn't dare hit him, however, as he was white. The fact that his fellow students would frequently be beaten, but he would not, is most likely what started his well-documented white supremacist views, believing that exemption from corporal punishment made him above his fellow students and teachers. These views were not exclusive to him, however. Var claims his father owned a swastika flag and hated living in the same town as the Iraqi people. In regards to his mother, Varg has stated that she was scared that he would one day, quote, come home with a black girl. There are also claims that Varg was part of a neo-Nazi skinhead group as a teenager, but he denies this, saying that there were no skinheads in Bergen. Varg began listening to heavy metal music when he was 12, and cited Iron Maiden as his biggest influence. His love of heavy metal led to him learning to play guitar at the age of 14. In 1992, at the age of 19, he started his own one-man black metal band, named Burzum. It was during this time that he met Euronymous, lead guitarist of the band Mayhem. Despite being a highly influential figure in the Norwegian black metal scene, he was nevertheless controversial due to his actions following the death of Mayhem's previous lead vocalist, Per Olin, better known as Dead. While Varg and Euronymous would collaborate musically, they would also take part in an event that would bring black metal music to the public eye for all the wrong reasons. On June 6th, 1992, the Fantoff Stav Church which had stood for over 800 years from the year 1150, was burned to the ground in what would be the first of many arson attacks committed by members of the black metal scene. Varg and Euronymous took part in the burning of at least one church together. In total, 50 churches were burned between 1992 and 1996. In early 1993, animosity had began to grow between Varg and Euronymous. While it's unknown what caused the rift, it resulted in Varg stabbing Euronymous to death in his apartment on August 10th, 1993. Varg claimed that he acted in self-defense, saying that Euronymous planned to stun him with a taser, tie him up, and torture him to death on camera. Varg's claim of self-defense is obviously questionable, as Euronymous had been stabbed 23 times, with 16 wounds being in his back. Varg was arrested on August 19th, 1993, the police found 150 kilograms of explosives and 3,000 rounds of ammunition in his home. He had apparently been planning on blowing up the Blitz House, a far-left social centre in Oslo. On May 16, 1994, after a two-week trial, Varg was sentenced to 21 years in prison for murder, the arson of three churches, the attempted arson of a fourth church, and for the theft and storage of 150 kilograms of explosives. In what's probably one of the most infamous moments in music history, upon receiving his sentence, Varg looked directly at the news camera in the courtroom and gave a chilling smile. Varg was released from prison in 2009 on probation and changed his name to Louis Cochet after moving to France. He has continued to face legal trouble since his release. In 2013, both he and his wife were arrested under suspicion of planning a terrorist attack after his wife purchased four rifles. The two were later released without charge, as the police were unable to find any evidence of a terrorist plot. However, Varg was charged with hate speech against Jewish and Islamic people due to posts he made on his blog, Thulian Perspective. He was given six months probation and an 8,000 euro fine. He has also been banned from YouTube due to the site's policies on hate speech. Despite his criminal history, Varg has built up a dedicated following due to the intrigue surrounding his past. However, as a convicted murderer, would-be terrorist and neo-Nazi, there's no denying that he belongs on a list like this. Harvey Philip Spector was an American producer and musician. He was born in the Bronx, New York on December 26, 1939 to Jewish-Ukrainian immigrants Benjamin and Bertha Spector. Phil experienced tragedy early in his life at only nine years old when his father committed suicide in April of 1949. Following this, 
Spector's family moved to Los Angeles when he was 14. He attended Fairfax High School, where he would meet several other aspiring musicians, including future Beach Boy Bruce Johnston and Louis Adler, who would later go on to become a successful producer. During his time at Fairfax, Spector formed a band called the Teddy Bears, who in 1958 would release the single To Know Him Is To Love Him, which would make it all the way to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Unfortunately, they were never able to replicate this success, and split the next year. Spectre then swapped performing for producing. While he would find success producing and writing records for a number of artists, the act that he would become the most involved with was the all-female R&B group, The Ronettes. In particular, their lead singer, Veronica Greenfield. The group's work with Spectre led to several hit singles in the early 60s. However, this success was short-lived, and Spectre went into seclusion for the next several years following this. During this time, he had begun a relationship with Veronica Greenfield while he was still married to his first wife. After divorcing her, he married Greenfield in 1968. Upon taking his name, she began professionally calling herself Ronnie Spectre, a name she would keep for the rest of her career. The two had no biological children, instead adopting three sons, Dante Philip and twins Louis and Gary. Ronnie would later allege that Spectre had been horribly abusive to her during their marriage. He was subjected to psychological torment by not allowing her to perform, effectively sabotaging her career. He surrounded his mansion with barbed wire and guard dogs and also took away her shoes to prevent her from escaping. One of the more bizarre claims made by Ronnie is that on the rare occasion that Spectre did allow her to leave the house alone, she would have to drive with a life-size dummy of him sitting beside her in some sort of sick way for him to be with her in spirit. During their marriage, Ronnie began drinking heavily and fell into alcoholism, but she seemed to have done this so she could attend Alcoholic Anonymous meetings and get out of the house and away from her deranged husband. Spectre had apparently even gone as far as to have a gold and glass coffin placed in the mansion's basement and told her that if she ever tried to leave him, he would kill her and put her body on display. In 1972, Ronnie was able to escape from Spectre's mansion with help from her mother, leaving all of her possessions behind. The two divorced in 1974. In the settlement, Ronnie was threatened into forfeiting all of her future recording earnings, with Spectre claiming he would hire a hitman to kill her if she refused. She was also forced to surrender custody of her sons to him. Years later, their sons, Gary and Dante, would reveal that Spectre was abusive towards them, with him keeping them captive in a similar way he had done to Ronnie. They also claimed that he would force them to engage in sexual acts with one of his girlfriends. In case you haven't figured it out by now, I'm just going to come out and say it. Phil Spector was a lunatic. Besides his horrific treatment of Ronnie Spector, he was also infamous for waving guns around in the studio. In 1970, while working on John Lennon's rock and roll album, Spector, reportedly high out of his mind on amyl nitrate, fired a handgun right next to Lennon's ear, seemingly as a sick prank. In 1978, while working on Lennon Cohen's Death of a Ladies Man album, a drunk Spector pointed a gun at Cohen's neck. Cohen, however, simply pushed the gun away. He also pointed a gun at Blondie frontwoman Debbie Harry and pretended to pull the trigger when he invited her to his mansion to discuss a studio collaboration. Most people probably assumed Spectre didn't have the guts to actually go through with shooting anyone. Sadly, in 2003, he proved that this wasn't the case. On February 3rd, Spectre met actress Lana Clarkson who was working a side job as a waitress at the House of Blues in Los Angeles. He invited her back to his mansion, which she accepted. After arriving in Spectre's limousine, the two went inside while the driver waited outside. An hour later, the driver heard a gunshot, followed by Spectre running out of the back door saying, I think I've just killed someone. Clarkson's body was found slumped in a chair with a gunshot wound in her mouth. Spectre claimed that Clarkson's death was due to an accidental suicide after she had, quote, kiss the gun. However, several other women came forward during his trial, claiming that he had threatened them with a gun after they had rejected his advances. On May 29, 2009, Phil Spector was sentenced to 19 years to life in prison for the murder of Lana Clarkson. He appealed this sentence several times, but was denied each time. He died in prison on January 16, 2021, after being diagnosed with having contracted COVID-19. Essentially, there are two Phil Spectres that are remembered today, one being the groundbreaking record producer who gave the world many classic records, and the other being a cold-blooded killer who murdered an innocent woman for rejecting his advances.
when I stand on the mountain and I say, do it, it gets done. If it don't get done, then I'll move on it. And that's the last thing in the world you want me to do. My videos aren't usually rankings, hence why I don't number the entries. But in this case, it's hard to deny that Charles Manson really is the most evil, deranged, and despicable person in this video, and probably the most evil musician who has ever lived. His story has become ingrained in American history, and he is one of the country's most infamous criminals. I don't want to go into too much detail about his life story in this video, as I actually want to make a full length video about him and the Manson family at some point, so I'll be discussing him here without giving too much away. Charles Manson was born on November 12th, 1934. It's fair to say that he was more or less a born criminal. He burned down his school when he was only nine and was regularly committing petty theft by 13. He spent the majority of his adolescent years in reform schools. Despite his lack of education, he was believed to have an IQ of 109 at the age of 16. He was also diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. In other words, he was diagnosed as a sociopath. His time in reform school was a never ending cycle of him escaping before being caught only to escape again. He was eventually moved to a maximum security juvenile detention facility where he stayed until he was 20 years old, as he was released a year early for good behavior. During his time out of prison, he married a waitress in January 1955. That October, he was arrested in Los Angeles for driving a stolen car over state lines. He failed to appear in court for this charge and a similar charge against him in Florida and was sentenced to three years in prison. While serving yet another sentence, this time in the United States Penitentiary in Washington, he learned to play the guitar with help from Alvin Karpis, leader of the Barker Karpis gang. He also met record producer Phil Kaufman, who believed that Manson's songwriting ability had the potential to land him a record deal. After his release from prison in 1967, Manson moved to San Francisco, where he met a number of women who he convinced to move into his apartment. Manson had become known to the hippies of the local area as a guru. He told these followers that they were the reincarnations of the original Christians and that the establishment were the Romans who wished to control them. Naturally, by this logic, he saw himself as a messiah-like figure, often telling a story where he pictured himself nailed to a cross. With a large group now made up of both men and women, they went on the road across the west coast of America and called themselves the Manson family. In 1968, two of Manson's female followers were hitchhiking and were picked up by a man who happened to be a famous musician, Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. He took the girls back to his home and while there, he talked to them about the Beach Boys and how they had been involved with a famous Indian guru named Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, to which the girls replied that they also had a guru, a man named Charlie. When Wilson returned from a recording session the next morning, he found that the entire Manson family was there. Charles Manson greeted him and said that the women there would do anything Wilson asked. The two built up a friendship of sorts, and Manson told Wilson about his desire to become a recording artist. Dennis took Manson to his brother Brian Wilson's home studio, where Manson recorded over 100 hours of material, though these tapes had never been released. He also wrote a song for the Beach Boys entitled, Cease to Exist. However, Dennis reworked the song and changed the title to, Never Learn. Manson responded to these changes by threatening to kill Wilson, who didn't let Manson intimidate him and instead ended their friendship. He left his home with the Manson family still living there and let the lease on the house run out, resulting in the family being evicted. It was at this point that Manson began his descent into madness that would leave several people dead by the end of 1969. After listening to the Beatles' self-titled album, or the White Album as it's more commonly known, he believed that it predicted a race war between white and black people. Manson called this apocalypse the Helter Skelter. To bring about this war that would result in the black people annihilating the white people, 
only for the family to emerge and rule over the former. Manson ordered the family to carry out attacks on white people and frame it in a way that implied the attacks were carried out by black people. The first victim was Gary Hinman, a music teacher who had befriended the family. He was held hostage for two days before being stabbed to death. The family used his blood to write Political Piggy on the wall and drew a panther's paw, the symbol of the Black Panthers. The second and most infamous of the murders took place on August 8, 1969. The family broke into 10050 Cielo Drive and began an attack that would leave six people dead. Stephen Parent was shot four times. Jay Sebring was shot, kicked in the face and stabbed seven times before dying of blood loss. Wojciech Frykowski was stabbed 51 times and shot repeatedly to death after trying to escape from the family. Abigail Folger was stabbed 28 times to death. Finally, the family turned their attention to Sharon Tate, actress and wife of director Roman Polanski, who was also eight months pregnant. She pleaded for her baby's life, offering herself as a hostage in hopes that they would let her live long enough to give birth. However, the family ignored her pleas and stabbed her to death. Manson ordered the family to, quote, leave something witchy, so they wrote, pig, on the front door in Tate's blood. On August 10th, the family murdered Leno and Rosemary LaBianca. Manson himself was actually present for this incident. The couple were both stabbed to death with rise and death to pigs written on the walls and held to skelter on the refrigerator door, all written in Rosemary LaBianca's blood. Manson and several other members of the family were arrested in October 1969 for auto theft. One of the female members of the family bragged to a cellmate about murdering Sharon Tate, and a biker who was an acquaintance of the family told the police that Manson had been bragging about killing five people. Manson and his associates who took part in the murders were sentenced to death. However, in 1972, the death penalties were reduced to life in prison. Manson himself remained in prison until his death from cardiac arrest on October 19, 2017. Phil Kaufman produced the album Lie, The Love and Terror Cult in 1970. The album was not a commercial success, but has become something of a cult classic. Today, Manson is only seen as a lunatic who managed to convince his followers to murder innocent people all because he believed it would lead to his deranged prophecy coming true. This is why, in my mind, he is the most evil musician who has ever lived. I see blood in here every day. Every day someone's getting shot, someone's getting cut, someone's getting beat. I've lived in that all my life, woman. That don't wrinkle up my forehead. You can pile up a hundred dead bodies up in front of my cell and it don't set me to do nothing. He was not Jesus Christ or Satan. He was a very odd, bizarre, high-energy, little antisocial who had some poor, confused, middle-class dropouts who decided to follow him. And he got into a situation where he had enormous power over these people, and he pulled it all together into this incoherent, hateful kind of plan. And there was no one there to say, Charlie, girls, this is crazy. And that's the end of the video, folks. I'm sorry there was only seven entries. The next time I make a list video, I'll try to include more than just seven. I also plan on uploading some slightly shorter videos so that you'll get more content out of me than just one or two videos a month. By the way, if you have any people who you would have included on this list, go ahead and let me know in the comments. Be sure to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe if you're new. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.